great to see you here today. Welcome to the City Bible Forum today. My name is Robert, Robert Martin, and I'm the director of the City Bible Forum here in Melbourne. The City Bible Forum is a place where we stimulate the big questions of life. Uh, we do this with rigour and respect, and today there can be hardly a bigger question is than what happened in the beginning, and that's the nature of our conversation today. We think that by respectfully listening to the views of those who hold opposing positions, that we can all examine our assumptions about a belief and ultimately determine what is truth. We hope that you will be leave the discussion in some way today challenged uh, by what is the discussion and the ideas that are raised. Uh, just to, to give you a brief idea of the format, we'll be all finished by about 20, 25 past one, so there's going to be plenty of time uh, for you to get back to your desks for an afternoon of productive labour on a Friday afternoon. Uh, but we'll make sure that we'll begin our discussion uh, fairly soon. <coughs> um, I'm going to introduce our panellists in a second and then we'll begin our discussion. And, but how the discussion proceeds, in some, to some extent, is up to you. Uh, you may participate by sending in questions to the text message, to the, to the number there provided, and, and I'll endeavour to incorporate those into our discussion this afternoon uh, as we proceed. Uh, so the format today is, is not a formal debate or a formal presentation, it's a conversation, discussion of ideas. We have three uh, people who are bringing different perspectives on this important topic of origins and what happened in the beginning. I'll introduce our first panellist today is Charlie Lineweaver, Dr. Charlie Lineweaver. Charlie is Associate Professor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences at ANU. Uh, his interests are in the field of astrobiology, cosmology and planetology. He's published numerous articles and has appeared many times on the ABC TV science show Catalyst, and he was actually on the Catalyst show last night, uh, and Channel 7 Sunrise. He's flown down from Canberra today to participate in this forum, and for that we're very grateful. Please welcome Dr. Charlie Lyon. Our next panellist is Dr. David Catchpool. David works for Creation Ministries International and he's a popular speaker across Australia and the world. He holds a PhD on nitrogen transfer between tree legumes, associated grass and ruminant animals, uh, which are goats. David has flown down from Brisbane and we're delighted that he can join us here today. Please welcome Dr. David Catchpool. <laughs> Our final panellist today is Dr. Lewis Jones. Lewis holds a PhD in astrophysics and his research was in the differential spectral synthesis of low luminosity elliptical galaxies. I think I'm going to do a PhD on that sentence. Um, <laughs> he also has an honours degree in theology and works for the Simeon Network which has a ministry to academics. He's flown down from Sydney to join us today and we're also delighted to have him. Please welcome Dr. Lewis Jones. Now today's topic is the beginning. What really happened in the beginning? And we'll begin with maybe you, you Charlie, you can tell us. So your area of research specialises in this particular area. So tell us, from your understanding, what happened in the beginning? Uh, is this working? Well, the, 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 yeah, okay. well the first thing to answer uh, what happened in the beginning is the beginning of what? You could talk about the beginning of the universe, or the beginning of stars, the first stars in the universe. You could talk about the earliest planets. You could talk about the beginning of our planet, which is correlated with the beginning of the sun. Or you could talk about the beginning of vertebrates, or mammals, or homo sapiens. So there's a wide range of things whose beginning we can talk about. And I've gathered that we would prefer to talk about the beginning of the Earth. Well, the, maybe, maybe we start with the beginning of the, maybe just the universe, perhaps? Okay, just, the universe. Well, that's a, a small that's kind of... Well, well that's why, because that is my specialty. I, I, I did my PhD at Berkeley. What we did, we analyzed data from a satellite called the COBE satellite. This satellite was uh, constructed specifically to look at the oldest photons that you can detect. Now, photons are particles of light, and you know that there's a sun, it takes light about 8 minutes and 23 seconds to go from the surface of the sun to us. And that's the nearest star. All the other stars we see are also suns in their own right, but they're much further away. For example, Alpha Centauri, which is one of the brightest stars in the south, mm -hmm. is about 4 light years away. And if you look as far away as you can, 
you see photons that have been traveling for as long as possible. And those photons were discovered in 1965. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background. And the satellite that I, whose data I analyzed was uh, the photons from the Cosmic Microwave Background. And uh, when we discovered fluctuations, hot spots and cold spots in this background radiation, um, it was a world news in 1992, and my PhD advisor got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006 for our discovery of these hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background. So is this, is this picture here, does that have anything to do with it? It does. That's a picture from a satellite called WMAP. Our, ma our picture was earlier. It wasn't quite as high resolution. But here you can see these dark spots here. This is I call this the Smoot pit. My advisor called George Smoot. So this is a biggest cold spot. Now that's interesting because this is the plane of the galaxy. And what you to understand this picture, these are the this is a baby picture of the universe of about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so here's a hot spot, here's a cool spot. The galaxy has been removed from it. The galactic plane is right here. So what you think is take this picture and wrap it around your head. And what you're doing is looking as far away as you can in three or actually seven frequencies in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, uh, and these are hot spots here, cold spots here, and these we interpret as being the seeds of galaxies. So, for example, when, well, it's a little bit, it gets more complicated, I go into a lot of detail. The point is that this tells us that there were over densities and under densities, three, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which then grew and grew and grew, and they collapsed and collapsed and collapsed to form the large-scale structure of the universe, which we see much closer nearby. There are, pl there are filaments of galaxies, there are walls of galaxies, and there are voids. And those were set up by these seeds very early on. So just to sort of clarify what you're saying here, so the, this, uh, from your understanding, is taken uh, how many, how many, what, how, how long ago are we looking at there in, from your, your... Okay, well the, the age of the universe, when I was, uh, when I was 20, we read in a book, the age of the universe is somewhere between 10 and 20 billion years old, and we're not quite sure. And then as we found out, we looked at these things and analyzed the pattern, the age of the universe turned, became somewhere between 12 and 16 or 17. And now we know the age of the universe to much higher precision, 13.75 billion years old and the error bar is in that last number. So these, now your, of course the next question is how in the hell did you get that number? Where does that come from? And that comes from analyzing the patterns in this. The patterns means there are lots of, lot, you can see that there's a characteristic scale here of this, the size of that dot there, that dot there. That's where most of the power is and we make uh, mod, there are models which say where that power should be by, by comparing that power to the models. That's how we infer the age using general relativity. Sure, great. Thank you. Well, I'm obviously, obviously very passionate. But you may be kind of take, take a seat <laughs> just, to, just to calm down a bit. Now, some people might interpret this this sort of picture as like a magic eye kind of thing or a pizza or something. It's David, a full sky. It's a, it's a full sky. It's, okay, it's a full sky. Entire sky. That's right. It's a yeah. lot of work. A lot of people, thousands of people, went into making this map. Right. Wow. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a sort of a. a Quite a quintessential image, I suppose, of the beginning of the universe, perhaps. It is. A baby picture of the universe. So, so when you look at, so some people would say, also, yeah, it might be a magic eye image, I'm not quite sure what you see in there. But, so Dan, when you hear what Charlie's just said, and what you observe with uh, this magic eye kind of W map kind of thing here, what, what's your take? What do you, what, what's your thoughts? Well, in, uh, in fairness to Charlie, I'll give two answers. The first answer is uh, from before I was 38 years old. Uh, before I was 38 years old, I happily swallowed everything that I was told about age of the universe and age of the earth and so on. Uh, but now I've got a very different perspective. I'm an unashamed Christian, uh, believer, and uh, the scriptures say that we're to let every matter be established on the testimony of two or more eyewitnesses. And so that's very different from what I was taught uh, at uni, which was that um, the present is the key to the past, whereas the Bible says no. Understanding what really happened in the past is the key to understanding the present. So my position is that the earth was created first in accordance with God's word, and the sun, moon, and stars were made after that time, which is the direct opposite of what the uh, the atheistic evolutionary line currently is. Mm -hmm. Well, so we're going to be okay. This is a, a potential tension here. So, but, so, or so maybe not a potential tension, a very real tension. Um, so, but so you were going to say a second thing as well, or was that that was? 
Uh, no, no, the second answer was my perspective. Oh, so your perspective, so, okay. Before and after. Um, if I didn't say 6,000 years, then yes. I say okay. the universe has only been around for the time it's taken the Earth to rotate on its axis about 6,000 times. Right, okay. So in that... So orbit the Sun about 6,000 times. So just to clarify then, so how do you then understand what, well, what is Charlie is now just kind of outlined for us in terms of particularly in seeing pictures like WMAP and ages like 13 billion years and so on, how do you understand what, uh, uh, those kind of numbers, etc.? Well, those numbers clearly contradict what God has said, mm -hmm. uh, so they can't both be right. Uh, so my position is that uh, God was there, he doesn't lie. Uh, we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle yet, um, but I would say we have uh, a better understanding of the universe than the atheistic perspective. And um, lest people say that uh, there's no uh, full-time academic uh, PhD scientists working in this field, uh, there are, and I'll point to uh, Dr. John Hartnett, who's now at the University of Adelaide, I should say Associate Professor uh, Dr. John Hartnett, and uh, he's making breakthroughs in this whole area of cosmology. He hasn't got all the pieces of the puzzle yet, um, but he's making breakthroughs, and when his colleagues say, uh, John, how did you... How did you do this? How did you get this international recognition for doing this? John says, I got a head start on you guys because I actually have God's word. Now, this doesn't this isn't an infinite book of knowledge. God is infinite in knowledge, but he's told us enough in this book uh, of what we need to know so that we can come to the right conclusions. Um, and so uh, creation scientists, creation believing scientists are making breakthroughs. Uh, will we ever understand everything about the universe? Possibly not because the scriptures say the heavens declare the glory of God. And when you look at um, uh, you know, the, the, some of the elements in the universe that contradict the billions of years ideas, it fits with having been designed that way by a creator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I suppose that maybe the, the, the question that arises in my mind, I suppose, and particularly as Charlie's talked about this, this particular image here, which seems to or has, has been uh, assumed that, you know, 13 billion years or something, that's a, that's a fairly large difference from 6,000. Uh, I just wonder, how do you exp explain to, to, to the people in here who might be puzzled by that seeming discrepancy, how, how do you kind of explain that? Um, do you want to explain a bit further? Where do I begin? Right. Um, well, we can, we can begin somewhere, I suppose, yes. <laughs> well, why don't we begin with the Earth? Yep. Because that's something that we can study. Um, and when you look at uh, the rate of genetic decay on the Earth, when you look at uh, how water can erode things quickly, um, things fit much better with the time frame that the Bible gives, that we were created about 6,000 years ago. Um, evolutionary geneticists actually look at the rate of decay of the human genome, because more and more babies are being born with genetic deformities than at any time in history. And uh, when they look at those rates of decay, they say, we should have become extinct at least 10 times over. If humans have been here 100,000 years, we should have been extinct about 10 times over. Uh, I say, we haven't been here 100,000 years, we've been here 6,000 years. And as for uh, water, water is a key element. Um, and uh, the scriptures actually say that there'll come a time when scoffers will forget about the global flood. And when you factor in the global flood and you look at the world around us, we've got a great explanation for layer upon layer upon layer of fossils, uh, steep-sided canyons that are way too wide to have been carved by the current rivers. And so when it comes to explaining Earth history, uh, creation-believing scientists have it all over the, uh, the long ages. Okay. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll come back to some of those. We'll be interested to hear some of Charlie's reactions to that. But maybe we'll bring you into the conversation here now, Lewis, because so when you look at the WMAP kind of image and hear what's, uh, what's your then, what's your what's your kind of perspective? Uh, yeah, well, uh, sorry, I'll hold this rather than okay. Okay. Uh, no, it's just not. Is that is it is that being projected at all? Yeah. No. No, I think I think it's just not. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Uh, uh, what, what is my, my first sort of? Uh, I turn this off. So we're okay, really working we on the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're gonna take that. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. 
<laughs> it, well, my, my first reaction to this is, um, that I, is to say to Charlie that I remember um, I, I was doing my PhD in astrophysics in, in, in Chapel Hill in North Carolina in 1992, and I, um, when the COBE results, the initial results that, that Charlie was um, studying for his PhD were, were released, um, I remember driving up actually to, uh, um, uh, to Washington to, to, um, to see the presentation. Uh, so that, was, that was good. Uh, it was a, a moment to remember. Uh, I, um, my perspective on this, yeah, so I guess in a sense there are a couple of, a couple of perspectives as well. I'm, I'm a Christian and I, I can say, uh, um, like David, I'm unashamed. Um, I, I uh, trust the, the scriptures um, a, as well um, for uh, my understanding of, of God and um, life in the world and so on. Um, and uh, my uh, perspective on, on the sort of origins and the, the 13.7 billion years and uh, the, the microwave background um, is, is really just that it's uh, fascinating. Um, it seems to me that that's the, that that's the best um, evidence we have, um, points to that conclusion. Um, now, I, mean, I am actually interested in what John Hartman is doing um, with uh, reworking um, the equations. Uh, to find out if you use different metrics and so on, what, what kind of pictures of the universe and structures of the universe you find. So I'm, I'm interested to see um, what, what comes out of that. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the current understanding, you know, the, the, the current um, way that general relativity is understood, um, that, that uh, I would say that 13.7 billion years is the, is the best um, result from the evidence that, that we have. Um, to match up with that, with our current understanding of, of general relativity. So, I mean, as the evidence stands, um, I'm a, I'm a uh, 13.7 billion year old uh, creationist. Um, that is, God created the world, uh, everything in it, and um, including humans and stars and galaxies and planets and, and so on and, and microwaves. Um, and uh, but the question is how we did that. Um, and, um, and and I think. Our current scientific understanding is is the best we have um, uh, to, to understand that. Mm -hmm. okay. I would argue our current scientific understanding is woeful because yeah. uh, if you were going to follow that line of evidence, you'd actually want an age of the universe that's about double 13.75, we were without the error bars, uh, because of the uniform cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, but so why don't you increase it? To that one. The you answer don't is, need to. I don't know what you're referring to. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to increase? No, the, the age estimate from the microwave background is a result of a lot of different work, and none of it suggests that it should be, let's say, 25 billion. Is that what you're saying? My understanding is, and okay. you guys are the cosmologists, I'm not. I know, so you can ask me about this. Okay. If you'd like. But but don't, say, don't say that, oh, the, re the data requires twice as old an age. That's just, just untrue. There's well, nothing about the, anything I know that would require the explanations to have a 30 billion year old or of universe. Then how do you explain the uniformity, the uniformity of the CMB? Because my understanding is you do need more than, uh, twice more than, 13.7 well, can, can you explain what CMB means? Yeah, this cosmic microwave background. This is, this is a map yeah. the cosmic microwave background. And the uniformity he's talking about is you have to understand the average temperature with micro background is 2.75, 2.725 to be exact. Really good down there. And this is a map of variations around that average. Right? And these variations are only a few parts in 10 to the minus 5. So it's very, very, very tiny fluctuations around the average. And that's the iso isotropy that he's referring to that he's saying is that you need a longer age to get that isotropy. And that's an idea that is not part of modern science, and so that's why I'm challenging him on that. So the question, the, to rephrase the question, why is this map so smooth? Although it doesn't look smooth, it really is. It's just that the, the contrast ratio has been exaggerated, so you can see the hot spots and the cold spots. Do you have a, you have a comment to Alas, I'm not a physicist. Okay, no, okay, we don't, we don't want to go beyond our, too far beyond our expertise. We've had plenty of other things to talk about. We've got another picture here, maybe we can move on to discuss. This picture here. I'm going to say, could I encourage everybody here, though? Please dig deeper on that point, and you'll find that it is a problem for the, the long ages. That the age of the universe is not enough to account for 
that being the full damage. Dig as deep as you want, you will not find what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing courage, we're doing courage digging, and uh, as I said, we're, we're uh, anticipating, we would like the truth to speak. Now maybe this is another, now this has been described as the oldest sort of history picture book in the universe. Now I'd love to hear what your thoughts on the, the this This is, uh, you're, 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 I assume you've seen this picture before, David. The, oh, uh, big, big news, and I would argue these things make big news precisely because they challenge the time frame of the Bible. Okay, so, so do you want to explain? Just explain that, unpack what you've just, you've just suggested there a bit more. Yeah. If somebody uh, makes an operational science breakthrough, what I would call an eyewitness science breakthrough, it's very hard to get uh, media publicity. Uh, but if someone makes some discovery about um, something that they can put an age label on it, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's the age of the pyramids that, that supposedly predate Noah's flood, in other words, older than four and a half thousand years, or whether you can invoke millions or billions of years, that is the dominant paradigm that the media is happy to, to portray. The 6,000 year paradigm gets virtually no air coverage whatsoever. Yep. Um, Nor should it. <laughs> well, so that would be a, a matter of matter of opinion and a, a dis discussion, further discussion. But so this is actually a picture of the extreme deep. Uh, what, what's this one? This extreme deep. There's an ultra deep and an extreme deep. This is the ultra. I don't know if this is the ultra. This is the Hubble deep field. So what it is the Hubble telescope has looked at a very small fraction of the sky. If you hold your hand up like this and and you look at the fingernail of your pinky, and that's about the size of the sky that has been looked at but it's been stared at for hours and hours and days and days, and then you get a deep field because you've probed very, very faint objects. So every single object in this image is a galaxy, except for images that look like this. There's a star in our own galaxy, and is there another star? No, every other, every other blob there is a galaxy, and to understand galaxies are groups of stars of about 100 billion stars and they're of different distances. Um, some of them are very close, some of them are very far. We get their distances from measuring redshift, which is uh, lines, spectral lines that we see have been shifted, either redshifted or blue shifted, kind of like Doppler shifts, say, of a car going by. That's a, that's a sound Doppler effect, and we're doing something similar when we look at the red shifting of spectral lines in each of these galaxies. In other words, we look at a galaxy, we look at this particular galaxy right there, and we say, oh, those spectral lines are here, therefore it is receding at a certain rate, therefore it's this, a certain distance. This is called the Hubble relationship, discovered by Edwin Hubble in 1929. Now this is taken as allegedly a very old picture of the universe, like a very, uh, according to the standard kind of scientific paradigm that's the early stages of the universe, yet no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. This is an image of superimposed. For example, this star here might be about a billion years old. These objects might be 10 billion. There are, there are galaxies at different distances. Some of them are very, they're very ages. Right, okay. The other image that you showed was all at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So that was one slice of the universe. This is many different ones because we're looking like, you're a galaxy, you're a galaxy, you're a galaxy. And we're just seeing all of them superimposed here. Right, okay. Well, so one of the, one of the observations in the chat and questions that comes as a result of seeing that is, is, that it, is to do about, well, this is looking back in time is it, because you're looking back, but then it's, it's suggested that there's actually fully formed kind of spiral galaxies and so on there, which is early in the age of the universe. Like, how can that be if it takes a lot, so long to kind of develop a galaxy and so on? Well, right. there seems to be fully formed galaxies. That's, that's one of the criticisms and one of the critiques of, of this particular <coughs> observation to this particular data. What, what do you make of that, Charlie? Uh, well, the answer to that is it's a, it had been a little bit of an issue, and that's why, for example, about 10 years ago, we thought that some objects in the universe were older than the entire universe. And you know that it's very hard to be older than your mother. <laughs> and so that was the paradox that modern cosmology was in. And to solve that, the recent detection of the uh, what's called the cosmological constant that Einstein put into his equations, we have found that to be needed to explain the cosmology. That's what Brian Schmidt, my colleague at Mount Strong Observatory, got the Nobel Prize for last year for the discovery that we need that, it's called lambda, to explain the many things about the expansion of the universe, but that also simultaneously solves this you are older than your mother problem. So uh, about 20 years ago, we were looking at uh, globular clusters, and we saw that these are 17, 18 billion years old, and the universe looked like it was 12 billion years old. So how could that be? 
And so the addition of this lambda term resolved that so that the universe is 13.7 and these cluster clusters are about 12 and a half or 13 billion years. So the age consistency has remarkably improved with the introduction of this lambda term. My observation is this is a classic example of how evolution and, and the long age thing is basically unfalsifiable. As soon as, <laughs> as, soon as they, they highlight a problem, they find a way of solving it by clever intellectual equation building and so on. Um, and so uh, I, I would say, see often we get accused of quote mining as well because we happily quoted what you just referred to there as being a problem. Uh, of course, it's only a problem until they find a way of solving it. Right. Like most problems. I was just going to add um, some, something to that, though, that the, those, the problems, the problem of the old, of the old ages with the globular clusters and the problem of, well, you know, the relative age then of the, of the universe um, are, are solved independently um, with the application of lambda. That is, that is, lambda wasn't invented to solve the problem. It was that when, um, you know, Brian and, and others you know, dis discovered that lambda was required to explain the, uh, the, the acceleration of the universe, the, the change in the Hubble constant over time of the universe, that then when you apply that through all of your equations, you discover that the globular clusters don't appear to be um, as old as, as they appeared to be originally. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not something that was introduced to solve that problem. It was introduced to match the data that was being, being observed. Um, from uh, from the work that Brian that Brian Schmidt was doing, and can I just say, Charlie, sure. um, one thing that frustrates me about this uh, lambda is that you didn't get the Nobel Prize for it. I'm not frustrated by that at all. <laughs> I, I remember in, in UNSW um, ages ago, Charlie called me into his office and said, "Hey, look at this! I'm, I've got this. Um, I, I just did, did this little meta study of all the um, for all the uh, you know cosmological constants and so on. You know, Hubble and Omega and all this kind of stuff." And um, he said. It looks like it looks like we need lambda to be positive in order to, in order to fit all the data. I um, mean, this was years and years ago. Um, I'm thinking, you know, when I heard Brian Schmidt got the Nobel Prize, I was like, where's Charlie Lyman? Anyway, well, as the questions just coming, I just I just this, this is a I've heard that someone said I've heard that calculating the age of the universe is related to the speed of light. Yes. What are the latest controversies about C or the, the uh, speed of light changing? Well, I'll start. I'll, just, I'll hand it straight over to you in just a second. But um, that, that's another UNSW um, uh, investigation as well. Nothing to do with me. I just let me make that plain. But um, yeah, but uh, they, they've been investigating their um, changes in fundamental constants, and particularly the fine structure constant, um, which is related to then other constants like the speed of light. Now, I'll let Charlie explain if that's all right. Yeah. Well, well I, a lot of this is complicated, and I'd like to simplify it. Um, when we look at a star. Stars of certain masses, like the mass of our sun, are this pretty much the same brightness. And we use something called a scan standard candle. So for example, let's suppose that you had a candle, 10 candles, and, one, and you're the observer, there's a candle here, candle here, candle here, candle here, and you know how bright each of those candles are because you study them in detail. And then, if I, if I show you a candle that's very far away, you can determine how far away that is by how bright it is. But you have to know how bright it was intrinsically. You have to know that it was a standard candle. So this is one of about 10 different ways that astronomers use to determine distances. We found out that we lived not in an island unit, we lived in a, a galaxy in about 1920, when there were standard candles that were discovered in a nearby cloud that used to be called a cloud in our, in our universe, but we found out it was so far away that it was another galaxy. This is our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. So based on a, a knowledge of a standard candle and see how faint they are over there, we got an estimate of how far away Andromeda was. And the estimate is about two million light years away. That means it took light two million years to go from that nearest galaxy to us. Now, two million years, importantly, is older than 6,000. So based on a much simpler idea of a standard candle in a neighboring galaxy, we know that the universe is at least two million years, and this is the most, this is only from a star there to come to here. So that's a, a date that I don't, now, I'm not sure what scientific evidence you will s cite to say that that's wrong, but you would need to if you wanted to defend 6,000 years old, right? 
No, I wouldn't, because you wouldn't. you're operating from a different rules base. My rules base is that every matter must be established on the testimony of two or more eyewitnesses. So, so God, say has said, God has said, all right, that what you're saying, in the light of what God has said, what you're saying cannot be true. So how then do scientists like Dr. John Hartnett approach this? Starting from the perspective that God's word is true, bit by bit they're putting together pieces of the puzzle that help to explain the distant starlight problem. So there's no evidence. Look, could I tell you, the physicists among you, please get John, get John Hartman's book, Starlight Time and the New Physics, and read it. And if you're too stingy to buy the book, there's plenty of articles <laughs> by John Hartman on our website, creation.com. Uh, no, I, think, uh, I think so. I think you're tr we're trying to, obviously, assumptions do matter in this kind of discussion. I think that's essentially what you're trying to say, David, is that right? That's correct. That's correct, yeah. It's sometimes it's very hard to distinguish between facts and assumptions. I, I would agree with you on that. And that's why it's so important to have lots and lots of facts and lots and lots of interpretations and lots of disagreement and tests and tests and tests. And that's what we do for a living. Yeah, but you cannot go back in time and test something. When a telescope is a time machine. When I'm looking at these people here, I'm going back in time by a few nanoseconds. And I'm not seeing them as they are. I'm seeing as they were a few nanoseconds ago. When I look at the nearest stars, I'm looking at them as they were four years ago, or 400 years ago, 4,000 years ago, depending on their distance. So yes, it, I can go back in time. Well, God has said, right, on the basis of the genealogies, the Earth was created 6,000 years ago, and the sun, moon, and stars after that. Oh, that's what Usher said, Bishop Usher said that. I don't know if God said that. <laughs> Yeah, but you obviously do not believe that the Bible is God's word. In fact, you don't even believe it. I'm a I'm an animistic atheist. I call myself a full blown secular scientist. In which okay, case, well, in that case, maybe we'll change, change the, maybe we'll change the maybe we'll change the conversation a bit. And the dynamic will probably shift a bit here. Now, at the the discussion at the, at the TV show last night on Catalyst, uh, they showed uh, the the. the Sort of controversy or the, the interesting nature of the apparent fine tuning of the universe. That there seem to be a number of constants and so on that do point to, uh, in the words of I think uh, Fred Hoyle, who suggested that there's a, a monkey, has, someone has monkeyed with physics uh, perhaps, to indicate that there's an intelligent mind behind the design of the universe. Because if we go back to the previous slide, if, it, if the, the constants have been different, the, the universe would expand too fast or not expand at all. Um, which indicates, that, well, the question is, well, what caused the beginning of the, of the universe? And that's, the, uh, in many ways, the, the, a leading philosophical question that's been asked for a long time. So why is there something rather than nothing? Maybe, Lewis, do you want to start that off? Uh, sure, I, mean, I think that um, uh, Paul, Paul Davies uh, is an atheistic um, uh, scientist and a, and a very uh, popular science writer. Um, he, he, he makes the point that the, the existence of something rather than nothing is, is, a, is a point at which an atheistic scientist uh, might uh, uh, be uncomfortable uh, because of the fact that um, <coughs> we need to explain somehow that the existence of, of what we have in, in front of us. And he says that unless you can come up with a way for the universe to be created from within the framework of physics, then uh, he says this cosmological sort of argument for the existence of God uh, would be hard to fault. Um, I mean, it's an interesting point, maybe, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that makes you uncomfortable as well. Um, but um, I, one thing I did just comment about that, and that is that uh, it is, uh, I do often hear the, the, the question, um, if I say God created the universe, um, I, hear the, I hear the question that comes back, well, who created God? Um, which, you know, you, it's a fair question. I mean, you're welcome to ask. Um, but um, and the, the response, I think, maybe the most helpful thing to, to think through about that is, is that it doesn't matter whether you think uh, God created the universe or whether the universe, the physical universe is all that, all that there is. Um, one way or another, both of those positions inhabit the same kind of s mental space. That is, that um, if you believe the physical universe is all that there is, then you are deciding to end that chain of cause and effect, in a sense, at the physical universe. And so you, all, you believe that your ultimate reality is um, an eternal and uncreated uh, physical universe. Um, if you opt for the, the, the other option and, and put, a, put a god that created the universe, um, then you're, you're just ending the chain there. Um, and, you're, um, and, and that is your eternal and uncreated reality. 
Um, but one way or the other, it doesn't matter which camp you live in, you believe in this sort of e eternal reality. You believe in this fundamental kind of being. And what it's, it's either a personal uh, creator or it's the physical, um, accidental, in a sense, uh, universe. So I'll sort of jump that in. Um, would you, you would, would you even disagree with what Lewis has said there? Would you don't? Or you? I think it could be articulated much better. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I agree with. Uh, the question, uh, if God created everything, then who created God? Uh, I understand where that's coming from, but it's actually a nonsensical question in light of what God has told us. Because uh, from our framework, we see that anything that has a beginning has a cause. But the Bible makes it clear that God doesn't have a beginning, therefore he is without a cause. Uh, which means that the question, uh, if God created everything, who created God, uh, is a bit like the question, uh, to whom did the bachelor marry? Who did the bachelor marry? By definition, the bachelor is single. By definition, the God of the Bible is without beginning and without end. He is eternal, therefore he had no cause, therefore there was no need for them to be a creator of the creator. So maybe, Charlie, it seems that you may have a problem in terms of, uh, you either have, either have to, or do you have to posit an eternal kind of, often the, the non-theistic kind of result is appealing to something like a multiverse or a future mind or something. Um, how, do you, how do you understand the, the origin of the, the, the matter and energy in the first place? Okay, so the question is, why is there something rather than nothing? Right? Yeah. And that's an old question. Some people think it's important, and Einstein thought it was important. I think it's not important, and for the following reason. When you ask a question, it's very important that you ask yourself, what are the assumptions that you're making? When you ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing, you are assuming that if nothing existed, that that would be a fundamental state that wouldn't need an explanation. Now. So, from my perspective, nothing is something that does not exist, and, and we're just pretending that it does, and then we're citing that as the basis of our assumption and our question. That's silly for me. You see things around you, so something exists, but to therefore suggest that, you, that nothing could exist is just it doesn't make sense to me. So that question doesn't make sense to me. Now, well, so that maybe we could rephrase it, so, but the matter and energy from the Big Bang, well, Began where did okay. come from? So let's, let's let's talk about causes. Now, every when people get into this, uh, they say, "Hey, where did the universe come from? Where did this come from? Where did that come from?" Sometimes physicists, uh, you know, like Paul Davies, that we talked about, say, "Hey, where did the laws of physics come from?" Now, interestingly, I when when Christians get asked where did God come from, sometimes they're uncomfortable and they say, oh, "You're not allowed to ask that question." And I think they both answered that question. Well, they said no, they didn't. They said, you're, "No, God says that he." he what was your answer? The answer was yeah. uncreated. Okay, so I mean, physicists could say, "Oh, these laws are uncreated too." That's not for me. That's not an answer. That's just saying, "Hey, it's, you can't ask that question." Um, but what, there's one scientific piece of information that's useful in this, and that is when you have suppose that there are two uranium nuclei. There, it's radioactive uranium. Here's one, and here's one. And after a while, you wait, and one of them decays, and eventually into lead. Now, quantum mechanics says that there is no explanation for that, why this why did this one decay and not this one? And usually common sense will say, well, maybe there was an alpha particle here, maybe this atom, this nuclei was different than this one and somehow. But the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is that no, there are no hidden variables inside of this one that made it decay. Our best description of matter at this level is statistical. That means there are no little details inside of that nucleus that made this one decay rather than that. And now I mention this because that is an example of a not, there's no cause for this one to decay rather than that one. And that, so in modern quantum mechanics, there is a suggestion that every book that is the standard now that there are no causes to this decay. So that's an example of a non-cause event. And because we need quantum cosmology to describe the various early universes, we do not necessarily have to, it doesn't necessarily make sense to ask about a cause mm -hmm. any more than it makes sense to talk about the cause of that decay. David, do you want to, or Lewis, either of you want to make a response? Or? To say that something happens without a cause defies what we would say. 
defies common sense. It does. It does. That's why it's physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Almost all. Of, that's why I study physics. So does almost everything about physics defies common sense. That's why it makes it so interesting and can be experimentally shown to be true. Uh, but or uh, consistent well, with experiment. But surely, when Paul Davies has an interest in where do the laws of physics come from, he is coming from a logical perspective that things do indeed have a cause, uh, and uh, <coughs> how do we find out the answer to that? And, and I, I respect people who want to find answers to the questions. Um, I don't think it's it's a good idea to say we shouldn't explore these things. No, I don't think. I think you should explore them, but not all, it is not always the case that your question makes sense. As a matter of fact, some of the most important things we can find out is that the questions that we're asking are based on assumptions that no longer are valid. <coughs> Things. I mean, when I have a group of students come in, one of the most important things they do is have to unlearn everything they learned before uh, <laughs> about special relativity and general relativity, etc. There's a lot of unlearning that's required if you're going to learn something new. In evolutionary theory, there's a lot of unlearning that has to be done. <laughs> so, a, a, a classic example of the question that is the wrong question to ask was asked recently by some researchers in North America who found uh, hadrosaur skin. And they said, how is it that this hadrosaur skin can have been preserved for 75 million years? Wrong question. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. That's going to be more about topic of discussion tonight, I think. Well, that's where we, so if you're not coming to the symposium tonight, then that's a, a good lesson to hear more about hadrosaur skin. If you've always wondered about hadrosaur, hadrosaur skin, <laughs> then tonight's the night to come and talk about that more. Hopefully, we can talk more about that. Lewis, I'll take a couple more questions from the audience here now. Um, okay. you, you can say something. Uh, yeah. So I, I, was, I was just going to um, add that and, and respond to Charlie as well. That, um, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about the, the issue, the, the cause of the, the existence of the universe in a sense, um, at that level of um, kind of was there, can you point to a cause at the, at the moment of, of creation? Um, I, I, I would just like to ask you the question, um, ask the question in general, which view makes more sense of the universe in which you live? So that, that's, that's the question I want, I want to ask, <coughs> is not is not whether we, we whether we can talk about a cause or not talk about a cause, but talk about whether there is whether the universe in which we live uh, bears the imprint at all um, of a personal uh, creator, or whether it, it is purely um, an accident. Um, it's what, what, which of those models fits what we our experience of the universe, purpose and meaning, and, and other things you can throw in there. So I just, just add that. Okay. I've got another question here, which is, I think is a good question, and it's. Um, in many ways ties up with one of, I think one of the key things we're learning today is that assumptions matter. Uh, so given the facts point to an old age, what evidence would you need to discover that would change existing assumptions and models in order to uh, suggest a younger age Earth? And what do you believe is the likely, likeliness of discovering and confirming this? So basically it's what sort of evidence would you, uh, would you need to find or which you affect your, which, which would alter your Assumptions. You, you have to alter. You have to change almost everything about modern science. For example, that star that is in Andromeda. You have to find out a way where it has to be. There are two ways. One is you have to change the speed of light, and we measure the speed of light over and over and over again, and it is constant, except for some of these early universe studies where people are speculating that it could change. Mm -hmm. But that is only at the very earliest point. Is, is, how, how dramatic is the change? Like, are we talking? How dramatic is the change of speed get, of light? Well, you need to get the Andromeda galaxy. Well, it's two million light years away. So if this is two million light years, you have to take this star, whose luminosity we think we know, and move it to about, right about here. So they're talking about two million versus 600, no, 6,000, 6,000. So that's a really, really, really big mistake if we are making that. And so, but every, all the data we have says, no, it's consistent. And that model is, it, for example, carbon-14 is another dating method that is probably the most obvious one. Carbon-14 is something that's being created in the atmosphere by cosmic rays right now. You take C12 and C13, it gets transformed into C14 by the impact of a cosmic ray. And then there's a, a small percentage of the carbon all over is falling into your body. You're breathing it right now. And we, when you die, that absorption of carbon-14 stops. And then a thousand years later, we can say, OK, how much carbon-14 is in that person? Now, as you know, radioactivity, if you have this much, half life later, 5,000 years later, you'll have this much. 5,000 years later, you have this much. 5,000 years later, you have this much. That's a, a rate, the law of radioactivity, if you will. It st strongly depends on your knowledge of how much was there in the beginning 
If you don't know that, then you can't date the thing. So there's something important called the closure age. In terms of a human being, it's when you stop breathing and you die. In terms of a bone, the same thing. And so that's how carbon-14 has been dated many, many, many thousands of objects. And we have an expert here, and I guess you use carbon-14 in some of your work. But the point is that the, there is no data that I know of, in, in, or I've ever talked to anybody, that carbon-14 shows that the, age, the oldest age that they've ever attained using radioactivity would be um, 6,000 years. It's just, it's, just, it's just, there are many, many thousands of datings using carbon-14 that show that there are objects older than 6,000 years. David, you're right. So, so the, the, the question, original question was regarding, so it seems like Charlie's saying that there's, uh, it would take, well, it's almost impossible, would you suggest, that, to change the, uh, the terms no, of your assumption? We never say impossible, it's just that there's the overwhelming, uh, all the evidence, the overwhelming amount of evidence. Science is never deals with absolutes, right? Yeah. We're only, we could be wrong and we admit it all the time, but the question is, we're more sure, when we have more evidence, we're more sure. We have more evidence, we're even more sure, and that's the nature of our certainty. Maybe, Dave, because you, you used to believe in a kind of a long age kind of piece, maybe what, what, what changed in your mind that affected your assumptions and so on that you now adopt in, in, in analyzing the scientific data? Implicit in your question is that it was the evidence that changed my mind. And uh, no, I've been up front. I've said that I converted to Christ, and then as a result of that, with a new paradigm, I look at the evidence and see that it makes sense of what God has said. So for example, uh, the, the evidences that have been portrayed here from uh, the universe beyond our Earth actually give conflicting dates, and that hasn't come out. For example, there are uh, bodies beyond the Earth uh, that give different redshift ages, and yet uh, better microscope, better telescopes have shown that they're actually physically linked. And if you want more on these things, just go to uh, an article on my website called 101 Evidences for a Young Universe. Now, we're up front in saying we can't prove from the evidence that the universe is only 6,000 years old. But nor can these long ages prove from the evidence that the Earth, that the universe is 13.75 billion years and the Earth is 4.8 or whatever it was at last reading billion years. But rather, when you look at the big picture of the evidence, it, it, it shows that you cannot, from the evidence, come to a consistent date. And I'm very surprised that Charlie talked about carbon-14 because uh, on the assumptions of carbon-14 decay, there should be no carbon-14 in uh, dinosaur remains, for example, or in diamonds, uh, because they are well over the, the, the current limit of carbon dating, which is about 100,000 years, I understand. Um, instead, you've got these specimens um, dated at about 65 million years old by other means, uh, with carbon-14 present. Well, there's carbon-14 coming into the atmosphere all the time. The question is, the dating Earth depends on closing that system so it's not open to new carbon-14. Okay. If there is carbon-14 in 65 uh, in these dinosaurs that are presumably 75 million years old, then it would be probably, I would suggest, you look into contamination yeah. from the last well, year, the year before, or 10 years ago, or 100 years ago. Contamination is the first response it, from the long age. It is. It's, it's all over the place. Science has to be so careful because contamination systematic errors are everywhere. That's why we require so much rigor and it takes time and more time and more time to experiment after experiment after experiment. Well, could I encourage you and everyone here, please dig through the secular peer-reviewed paper history of Dr. Mary Schweitzer and you'll see over a period of uh, 16 years now, she and her colleagues have very carefully tried to plug these contamination gaps uh, and the evidence is becoming more and more uh, irrefutable. We, we do have, and we'd love to keep talking, but we have to, it is lunchtime, so we have to finish up. Just maybe one minute in just in closing. I think that there's a couple of themes that have emerged today. I think there's some helpful and fruitful uh, avenues of further uh, reflection and, uh, and, and thought. Maybe we'll start with you, Charlie, and we'll just work across and have one, one minute. One, one minute, close it, close it, and then we'll, just, just one minute, and then, um, then we'll finish up. Oh, yeah, I guess, uh, in one minute, I'd say, uh, as I say, I'm a scientist. What I look at is scientific evidence for you. That's, that's funny, wasn't it? I didn't laugh. <laughs> so, so I am. I'm not a Christian. I'm not coming at this from any religious point of view. I'm coming at it. If you want to call science religion, you can do go ahead. Uh, I wouldn't. But uh, 
So I see evidence and I say, how do you know that? And I, when somebody tells me the age of, of anything, I say, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? And, and then you look at the peer-reviewed papers, as he as he's mentioned, and then you say, okay, this guy says this, this guy says this, then they've had an argument over the last 10 years and it's been resolved by some new technique because it makes more accurate, etc. I mean, that's what science is all about. And that's why I trust it so much because it is a result of lots and lots of hard work and lots of skepticism. No one is more skeptical of oh, well, scientists are very skeptical, and that's how they make their living. So if you want uh, knowledge that I, at least from my perspective, I've heard so many lies, so much propaganda out there, so many different religions making different claims, that I say, wait a minute, I trust science to tell me if I can then investigate how they did it and how they got to know that. That's why, uh, okay, that's why I believe in science. Thank you. Dave? Yes, Final closing, closing thoughts? Uh, I would argue that the only way we can know what happened before we were born is with uh, the account of someone who was there who doesn't lie and uh, God fits the bill and we have his word in the Bible. Great, thank you. Yeah, looks Thanks. And, and, yeah, and, I, and I need to say um, uh, as well, I mean, on this question of assumptions, uh, that um, Charlie and I agree about the age of the universe, <coughs> the best, you know, as best I know it, I'm a little bit out of the game these days. Um, but David and I agree on all sorts of things, um, like that Jesus rose from the dead, for instance, uh, right? We, we agree on this. We agree on every Christian creed that um, has ever been formulated. Uh, but otherwise, otherwise, your history and, of the universe is no different from Charlie's. And, oh, that's not necessarily the, the case, but, the, um, uh, but the, in terms of assumptions, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that interpreting the Bible also comes with its own set of assumptions. And so we need, we need to make sure that as we read the Bible, um, we're asking ourselves, is this the correct interpretation? Is this not the correct interpretation? Um, what have other people said about this? What kind of methods do we use to read the Bible? And so I think that's going to, if David and I differ on something, it's going to be actually on our methods of interpretation uh, of the Bible, not on whether we um, put our trust in Jesus for, for salvation, right? That's, that's going to be um, a common theme for us, but it's going to be, a di the difference is going to come in the, simply the way we read the Bible. So, well, my prayer is that over the next two days, those differences will be wiped out because the scripture actually commands us to be of one mind. <laughs> Please thank our panelists for a fascinating <laughs>